Well, a few years back, right about this time of year, the last week of November, I got a call from a family in a church that I had served many years earlier. A 46-year-old man named Tim had just died of cancer, and his wife, Sheila, was asking if I would come and uh, do his funeral service. I'd never gone back to a church I served before to, to do a funeral or a wedding or anything else, and I'd always said I never would. So I very politely and delicately told her I just could not do that. The next day, the pastor of the church called. He insisted he wanted me to come speak at the funeral, that he really wanted me to be there. So I thought a few moments and then agreed to assist him. I knew Tim and Sheila very well and had been through a lot with their family. It began with the premature birth of their granddaughter, Electra, at 25 weeks. Electra weighed less than two pounds and was immediately life-flighted to Texas Children's Hospital where she battled for her life for much of her first year. During the first few weeks that she was at Texas Children's, the doctors told the family Electra was in the worst condition of any preemie in the hospital. And since it's often only the most critical cases that come to Texas Children's, they did not expect her to live. But Tim and Sheila, their family, friends, and the church family, we didn't give up. We kept on praying, and Electra kept struggling for life. That little girl had eight or nine surgeries during the first year of her life. She had them on every major organ in her body. And several times, just before she was taken into surgery, the doctors approached the family and said something like this. Electra needs this surgery to live, but it's highly unlikely she's going to live through the surgery. And if she does make it, we don't expect her to live for very long. So, we recommend not having the surgery. There's no reason to prolong the inevitable. Tim and Sheila and family always listened, but each time felt compelled to go ahead with the surgeries. And as Electra pulled through them again and again, they witnessed what the doctors called one miracle after the next. Little Electra was an inspiration to people in the hospital, to people in our church, to people all around the community. The way God was working through her life helped move many people to a much greater, much deeper faith. She was a visible sign of God's power and love. She was a source of hope to a whole lot of people. Just about the time the family began to relax about Electra's condition, Tim was diagnosed with cancer. He had lymphoma. So he began a series of treatments with faith and with confidence in God, with a lot of prayer, and with great hope for healing and a much better future. Soon after Tim began treatments for his cancer, his wife Sheila was diagnosed with breast cancer. She went through chemo and radiation. She lost all of her hair had a few surgeries, and she did it with grace and an unwavering faith in God. And while Tim and Sheila were both engaged with their own battles against cancer, Tim's father, Jack, who already had a serious lung condition, was diagnosed with lung cancer. Talk about a family facing adversity. Well, Tim was eventually told he was in remission. Sheila got the same news, but Jack very peacefully, with grace, and with joy, went home to be with the Lord about a year later. The family endured all of that in about three and a half short years. For some people, it would have been far too much. They would have collapsed under the weight of it all. And many would have given up on God, but that family never did. They held it together. They kept praying. Prayer actually helped them hold it together. It kept them strong, and they came through it, through every bit of it, with more faith, much more faith than they had in the beginning when little Electra was born. So three years after Jack's death, when Tim was diagnosed with cancer a second time, this time with untreatable esophageal cancer, just several months after he'd been laid off, the family faced it with faith in God who kept on bringing them through. God had blessed the family. God had been gracious to that family, and they knew it. But this time with the esophageal cancer, 
the miracle of physical healing they were praying for did not come for Tim. The family did, however, take comfort and still takes comfort in knowing that God is real and loving and powerful, that his promises are true and that Tim is with Jesus in his heavenly kingdom today along with his father Jack. So it was a packed house at Tim's funeral. They'd had an impact on many people in the community. And as funerals often are, it was emotional. And it was beautiful. It all went so well. And the very best part came last. As the service ended, Electra, who was six years old and in first grade at the time, walked up on stage all by herself to speak for the family. She held a microphone in her tiny little hands and she read these words. We would like to thank everyone for coming and celebrating my pawpaw's life. Then she looked up toward the heavens and she said, we love you and we'll miss you, pawpaw. The church erupted with applause and laughter and tears. The sight of Electra on stage, the sound of her voice reading those words so beautifully and flawlessly was so sweet. But as you know, there was a whole lot more bound up in that moment. That miracle child, Electra, who wasn't supposed to live. That miracle child, Electra, who when she did live, wasn't supposed to ever be able to walk or talk. Let alone be able to read or have a normal life. That miracle child elector was a powerful, visible reminder to everyone there of our God of hope. What gives you hope? Is it something in your own life, maybe something you've seen in somebody else's life? What gives you hope? Jesus came into the world to give us all hope. He came to a world lost in sin and death and darkness to lead us in a new direction, back to God, into the light and never-ending life. Jesus came as a newborn baby. He was and is and always will be our child of hope. Our Bible reading this morning tells something about Jesus' birth. I'll be reading from the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew and invite you to stand as you're able and follow along as I read Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. God chose Mary to give birth to his son. One reason God chose Mary is specifically because she was not married. It may sound a bit odd at first, but it was the best way. It makes sense. Since Mary was not married, and since she was living a life pleasing to God, There was no question she was a virgin. That removed any question of paternity. Jesus was God's own son. 
was through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we read, that Mary became pregnant. Exactly how that work, <laughs> exactly how that work is, a, how it worked, is a mystery to us. We we don't know. But a miracle like that was a very simple thing for the one who created the universe and everything in it. No trouble for God to pull that off at all. So Mary's miraculous, miraculous pregnancy in and of itself gives us reason for hope. It tells us God is actively at work in our world. It tells us God has the power to accomplish his will. It tells us there's more to God than meets the eye. There's some mystery there. We don't, we can't completely understand all that there is to God. But since God is love, and since we know God is at work for our good, we have hope. At some point, this news about Mary's pregnancy traveled to Joseph, and when he found out, he was not the least bit pleased to hear that. His fiance was pregnant, and he knew he didn't have anything to do with it. So he decided to call the wedding off. He was done with Mary. At that point, he felt he only had a couple of options. He could either expose Mary, humiliate her and her family, and, and possibly uh, subject her to being stoned to death for what he thought she had done, or he could quietly call the wedding off and simply walk away. Joseph, being good and honorable, chose to walk away quietly. But then God sent an angel to him in a dream, and the angel explained everything, that Mary hadn't been unfaithful. There was no other guy. The child she was carrying really was God's own son. Suddenly, Joseph realized there was a third option. And if he wanted to be faithful to God, the angel told him it was the only option. According to the angel, he needed to hang in there and marry Mary. So Joseph's encounter with the angel also gives us reason for hope. It tells us God intervenes in the lives of people facing difficult decisions and confusing situations they just don't understand. It tells us that with God, the best option is something we might not even think of or consider on our own. And it tells us everything works out best when we follow God, when we listen, and when we let God lead. Looking at the ways Mary and Joseph let God lead their lives in the days leading up to the birth of Jesus gives us hope. But the amazing things God did through Jesus after his birth, during the days he walked this earth, provide us with the greatest hope the world has ever known. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. For me, to think that the God of all creation, the source of everything good and just and righteous, the loving, pure, all-powerful God, to think that God wanted to be in the world with us, living like us, walking among us, knowing our temptations and sufferings, to think of God in this way, is a source of great hope. Since God was one of us, God truly knows us. So we can rely on him even when we feel overwhelmed and cannot see a way forward. We can rely on God to save us, to guide us through life in this broken world and into a life in his kingdom that is far better, far more beautiful than we can even begin to imagine. Jesus brought that hope into the world. He also gave sight to the blind, made the crippled get up and walk, cleansed people of their diseases, gave hearing to the deaf, raised the dead to life, proclaimed good news to the poor. Jesus offered people, all people, what they needed most. He met the sinful right where they were, then challenged and encouraged them to live better lives. There was hope. And everyone who responded to him, everyone who was willing to listen and follow, 
experienced God's love and power, and they all, every one of them, found hope. I'm going to tell you about a boy who needed to find some hope. His name is Danny Keith. Anybody heard of him? Maybe, maybe you'll realize when I start talking. Shortly after Danny's birth, he had a massive brain hemorrhage, and he wasn't supposed to live. His mother didn't think she was ever going to bring him home from the hospital. But by the grace of God, Danny overcame the odds. I heard about him when he was seven years old and in first grade. About the biggest challenge he had at that point was a speech impediment. But he's been going to speech class and working really hard so he can communicate more clearly. One of Danny's older brothers played peewee football. So Danny, who was around the team all the time, served as her water boy. And he looked like a mini Tom Landry, as you can see, dressed in a suit, coat, and a tie, and a fedora hat. He dressed the same way for school. That was Danny's look. Well, one day some kids began to pick on Danny. They began to bully him because of the way he speaks and because of the way he was dressing. When Danny's older brother heard about it, he told the boys on the football team. And they got involved. The 11-year-old quarterback, Tommy Cooney, took the lead. And he called for a school-wide Danny Appreciation Day. That day... 45 boys went to school dressed like Danny in suits and ties to show their support for him. Here's a brief video to see the quarterback talking about. Daddy, Daddy, in the middle of it all, Danny, Danny Keefe, Bridgewater Daddy, first grader, water boy for the Williams School fifth grade football team. Who are they? Daddy, Daddy. Danny always wears a tie and jacket. He has some speech issues. A few other kids had been picking on him about that, and yesterday his team dressed up to show they don't approve. We heard that Danny was getting picked on, so we thought that we would all have a day to dress up like Danny, and we thought we would all come to school like Danny and sponsor Danny to um, show Danny that we love him. And that we love him very much. Do you think this has all made him very happy? Yes. Why? Because everybody's cheering him on and when he's, everybody loves him. Danny suffered a brain hemorrhage after he was born. Years of speech therapy are helping and so did yesterday. When you came out of the hospital yeah. was the best day. Yeah. But this was a really great day. Yeah. We didn't want him to um, just keep getting picked on, so maybe if we wore all suits, they would stop picking on him. Tommy knew that was the right thing to do. He went ahead and did it, and you know, 45 other kids had stood by his side. It was very emotional yesterday, and um, before he went to bed, he was crying, and I said, what's the matter? And he said he felt very loved, and so that's my wish for him every night. After today, their little big man on campus should sleep very well again tonight. Thanks to his friends, the best. Then his parents, you saw them speaking on that video. They were overwhelmed by the support uh, their son received. The, like, the older kids began to look out for him and to include him in what they called their band of brothers was incredibly heartwarming. So the football team could have decided to go find those kids who were picking on Danny and bullying him. And uh, as a team, I'm sure they could have taken care of him, could have beaten him up. They were the biggest, strongest kids in the school. There would have been no problem. But they chose a better way, a, a loving way. They chose to stand with Danny, to be like Danny in the way he dressed. And that had a far more powerful outcome. Instead of beating up or bullying the bullies, they opened the door for God to tug at their hearts. When they saw 45 other boys all dressed up like Danny, supporting Danny, that must have given God an opportunity to tug at the hearts of those bullies. We hear a lot of stories about bullying and other problems in schools these days, but this bullying story this bullying story gives us hope. It gives us hope to see a group of kids stand with someone in need. It gives us hope to see a group of kids acting 
with love. It gives us hope to hear that Danny truly feels the love, that he has hope himself. And you know, that's exactly why we're in the world. That's what the church is in the world to do, to speak and act with love, to give people hope. The Bible makes this clear in 1 John 4. It says, Dear friends, let's love each other because love is from God and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God because God is love. What would our world be like if every single Christian took this seriously? What would it be like if we all stood with the powerless? What would it be like if we all reached out to people in need with love? There'd be a whole lot more people telling others about what God has done for them. <clears throat> and this world would be filled with hope. Jesus did not come into the world so we could have a special day to give expensive gifts to each other. Did you know that? Jesus didn't come here so we could sit down and feast and overeat, feel sick and, and put on the pounds. That is not at all why Jesus came into the world. Jesus came into the world to give us hope. And he still does it today. Whenever and wherever his people are willing to help people in need feel the love. Amen.